With the second highest death toll of all African conflicts, the Nigerian Civil War, also known as the Biafran War, is perhaps the single most significant event in Nigerian history. This three-year conflict, which raged on from the 6th of July 1967 till the 15th of January 1970, would claim the lives of over 100,000 soldiers and an estimated 2 million civilians as the Nigerian government led by General Yakubu Gowon fought to prevent the secession of the self-proclaimed Republic of Biafra, which was led by General Chuku Emeka Odumegu Ojuku. To fully understand the root cause of this brutal conflict, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning. Upon gaining independence from Great Britain in 1960, the newly formed Nigerian Republic was greatly divided as its three largest ethnic groups struggled to live in harmony. Beyond the more obvious distinctions like language, clothing, and marriage customs, Nigeria's three main ethnic groups also had fundamental differences in values and worldviews which had been developed over the many centuries leading up to the colonial era and the formation of the Nigerian state. The Igbos, who represented about 60 to 70 percent of the population of the Southeast, were mostly Christians who in the centuries before the colonial era had lived in relatively egalitarian societies. Although most Igbo towns and villages were headed by monarchs known as Izes, the political decision-making process within Igbo communities was actually quite democratic as it involved general assemblies composed of title holders and other respected members of Igbo society. Status was acquired through one's ability to solve societal issues and respect was given primarily to those who had acquired wealth as opposed to those who had simply inherited it. The character of Okonkwo in the book Things Fall Apart by renowned Nigerian author Chinua Achebe was in many ways the perfect illustration of the uniquely Igbo vision of the self-made man. The Igbo's particular appreciation for wealth creation through hard work is undoubtedly the main reason why many of Nigeria's champions of industry have been of Igbo ancestry. By contrast, the majority Muslim Hausa Fulani, which represented about 65% of the northern population, had lived for many years in feudal societies in which large working class populations were ruled by a small theocratic elite composed of emirs and sultans. As their political leaders often doubled as religious leaders, compliance and submission to the will of the political establishment was not simply a civic duty but a religious one. Very much unlike in Igbo societies, there was nothing particularly odd or shameful about a man aspiring to live a modest life as a farm worker, craftsman, or a nomadic cattle herder. But contrary to commonly held prejudices, the Hausa Fulani were not in any way lazier or inherently less enterprising than their southern counterparts. They simply had a deeper appreciation for religious discipline and had a more socially conservative worldview. However, there is no denying the fact that while the unquestioning submissiveness of northern societies to the theocratic establishment guaranteed internal stability and order, it also meant that the North was a lot less economically vibrant. Northerners were generally less open to new ideas and often completely rejected secular education in favor of Islamic education. Demonstrating the extent of Nigeria's North-South divide, some studies estimated that as at Nigeria's independence in 1960, Northern Nigeria had an English literacy rate of just 2% compared to the Southeast, which had an English literacy rate of 19.2%. The Yorubas, which formed about 75% of Nigeria's southwestern population, were in many ways a sort of halfway house between the Igbos and the Hausa Fulani, both in terms of their religious affiliation and their political history. Although also majority Christian, they nevertheless had significant populations of Muslims as well as followers of the ancient Yoruba religions. In simple terms, the traditional Yoruba political structure was basically less autocratic than the Hausa Fulani, but not as democratic as the Igbo. For centuries, Yoruba societies were ruled by kings known as Obas, who governed in close consultation with chiefs, priests, and priestesses. Culturally, the Yorubas were quite similar to the Igbo in their appreciation for individual drive and ambition. However, the Yorubas tended to channel their energies towards excellence in the arts and academia, as opposed to pure industry and wealth creation. Many often point to the Yoruba's deep appreciation of the arts as the reason why many of Nigeria's most prominent cultural icons such as Afrobeat legend Fela Kuti and the Nobel Prize laureate Professor Wale Shoyinka have been of Yoruba ancestry. But to say that the differences between Nigeria's three main tribes meant that every Igbo, Yoruba or Hausa Fulani person hated anyone who wasn't from their tribe would be very far from the truth. In reality, most Yoruba societies got on well enough with Igbo societies. The main culture clash, if you like, 
was between the Hausa Fulanis of the North and the two major ethnic groups of the South. Prior to the colonial era, ancient Yoruba kingdoms such as the Oyo Empire had for many years suffered under several waves of jihadi attacks by the Islamic Sokoto Caliphate of the North led by the famous Sultan Uthman Danfodio. Now although the Igbos did not have a similar history of warring with the Hausa Fulani, the British colonial enterprise would create the perfect environment for the sharp differences between these two tribes to be brought to the forefront. In 1914, British High Commissioner Frederick Lugard effectively created the country we know today as Nigeria by bringing the northern and southern regions together in the now infamous Nigerian amalgamation of 1914. Till this very day, the feeling amongst many Yoruba and Igbo historians is that one of the main purposes of this amalgamation was to place the more affluent South under the control of the autocratic North. The theory goes that by joining the more educated and therefore less controllable Southern region to the much larger Northern region, the British government was better able to implement its policy of indirect rule as the amalgamation essentially gave dominion over the entire country to the Northern elites who were significantly less rebellious and generally more amenable to British interests. It is also worth noting that from 1914 onwards, the British adopted a practice of placing northerners in key leadership positions within the colonial administration. Despite being generally better educated, southerners were more often than not limited to managerial and executive roles within the colonial apparatus. When the struggle for Nigeria's independence began to take shape, it was mainly Yoruba and Igbo intellectuals such as the political activist Fumi Ransom Kuti and the renowned jurist Jaja Wachuku that led the fight for Nigeria's sovereignty. According to some historians, many of the northern elites were not at all welcoming to the idea of an independent Nigeria as they feared that independence would mean losing the privileged positions that they had enjoyed under the colonial structure. The story goes that as a condition for them agreeing to support the push for Nigeria's independence, the northern leadership specifically demanded that the new nation maintain its colonial political structure and even though it pretty much guaranteed a continuation of the north's dominance, the Igbo and Yoruba leaders, in their desperation to gain independence at all costs, agreed to the North's demands. And so upon its independence on the 1st of October 1960, the Nigerian state was divided into three geopolitical regions in which a disproportionately large northern region was united with two smaller eastern and western regions. Nigeria's British-style parliamentary government was led by its first and only Prime Minister, Alhaji Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the northern co-founder of his political party, the Northern People's Congress. Tafawa Balewa's NPC party governed in coalition with the Igbo-aligned National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, which was led by Nigeria's Governor-General, Dr. Unamdi Azikiwe, the man who would later go on to serve as the ceremonial president of the first Nigerian Republic, which was established in 1963. The Yoruba Aligned Action Group Party, which was headed by Chief Obafemi Awolowo, played the opposition role. If unity was the goal, then the Nigerian state had gotten off to a very bad start. Nigeria's parliamentary system was a bit of a farce, as Nigeria's three main parties were not built around ideology, but on ethnic nationalism. With the vast majority of Nigeria's general population still largely unfamiliar with the Western-style democratic system of their new country, Pretty much everyone voted based on ethnicity. The Southwesterners voted for the AG, the Southeasterners for the NCNC, and the Northerners for the NPC. And as the Northern region was by far the largest constituency, the NPC was basically guaranteed control over Nigeria as none of the other two parties could compete with the NPC's large Northern voting base. As you can imagine, it was only a matter of time before the shoddy foundations on which the Nigerian state had been built began to show serious signs of strain. The entrepreneurial spirit of the Igbos would see many of them move out of their hometowns in search of all the opportunities their new nation had to offer, from Lagos to Benin, Port Harcourt, and even major northern cities like Kano and Kaduna. Igbos began to build businesses and pioneer new industries in the places they migrated to. But as is often the case with successful immigrants, it wasn't long before many of the locals especially in the north, began to feel more than a bit uncomfortable with the success of their new neighbors.
One thing I've noticed, Premier, while I've been here, is that Northerners seem to have, I might almost call it, obsession about the Ebos. Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Ebos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't ten northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians a temporary or permanent one? In actual fact, what it is, is a northerner first. If you can't get a northerner, then we take an expatriate like yourself on contract. If we can't, then we can employ another Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can foresee, because it will be rather dangerous to see the number of boys we are now turning from our, all our learning institutions coming out with having no, no work to do. I'm sure whichever government of the day might be, it will uh, feel rather embarrassed, and it might even lead to bloodshed. Doesn't this damage the idea, sir, of uh, all people in all regions in, in Nigeria being fellow citizens of one country? Well, it might, but uh, um, you are, an, I mean, new to our region, but how many northerners are employed in the east or in the west? The answer is no. And if there are, there may be ten laborers employed only in the two regions. It was against this backdrop of rising anti-Ibo sentiment in the north that the chain of events that ultimately led to the civil war would begin to unfold. By as early as the year 1966, most Nigerians had already begun to resent the ruling elite for their lavish lifestyles and lack of sensitivity to the concerns of the masses. Rumors about vote rigging, corruption and backdoor deals between politicians and foreign companies began to spread and there was a general sense of discontentment in the air. Deciding that enough was enough, Major Chukuma Kaduna Inziogu, an Igbo officer in the Nigerian army, instigated a revolutionary coup against the federal government. This coup would see the assassination of the Prime Minister Tafua Balewa, the Premier of the Northern Region, Sir Amadu Bello, as well as the Premier of the Western Region, Chief Samuel Akintola. But rather suspiciously, the President, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, would manage to escape the bloodbath as he was out of the country on holiday when the coup took place. But despite the execution of many key members of the government, the coup led by Major Inziogo was ultimately unsuccessful, as it was quashed by a different faction of the Nigerian army, led by Major General Johnson Aguyi Ironsi, who interestingly enough, was also of Igbo ancestry. After managing to secure the surrender of the coup plotters, Aguyi Ironsi was declared military head of state. But even though both the instigator and the stopper of the coup were of Igbo descent, various conspiracy theories began to spread in the north, suggesting that the entire thing was all part of an undercover master plan to put General Agunyi Ronsi in power and transfer control of Nigeria over to the Igbos. Oddly enough, there was actually a fair bit of evidence in support of this theory. Four out of five of the coup plotters were Igbo, and although Agunyi Ronsi stopped the coup, he did not execute any of the coup plotters. To make matters worse, no significant Igbo leader was killed in the coup. President Namdi Azikiwe had avoided all the drama thanks to his suspiciously timed holiday, while Michael Opara, the Premier of the Eastern Region, had also managed to survive the coup, even though he did end up losing his job to Colonel Chukwe Mekaujuku, the man who would later go on to lead Biafra's attempt to break away from Nigeria. These anti igbo conspiracy theories would eventually grow from mere rumor and conjecture to an article of faith in the minds of many northerners. And on the 29th of July 1966, a group of northern army officers instigated a counter coup against the Iransi administration. 
Unlike the previous one, this coup was successful. Major General Aguinyi Ronsi was assassinated and Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon, a northerner, was installed as Nigeria's new military head of state. Unfortunately, the northern retaliation would not end there. In the three months following the coup, an estimated 8,000 to 30,000 Southeasterners living in the north would be attacked, killed and robbed by local mobs. Fearing for their lives, over 1 million Southeasterners fled back to their homelands, leaving behind businesses, homes, churches and in some unfortunate cases, children that had been the fruit of inter-ethnic marriages. With the deluge of refugees flooding back into the eastern region with shocking stories of betrayal and trauma, the Nigerian project was on the brink of collapse. As many Easterners no longer felt safe in other parts of Nigeria, the military governor of the eastern region, Colonel Ojuku, began to call for Igbos from all around Nigeria to return home. Rumors about the eastern region's impending breakaway from Nigeria became front page news after it was reported that a plane carrying imported weapons had crashed in the eastern city of Enugu. Knowingly or unknowingly, Colonel Ojuku essentially confirmed all rumors with a series of rousing criticisms of the Gowon administration's failure to provide adequate protection to the thousands of Igbos who were being attacked and killed by people they imagined were their fellow citizens. With tensions at an all-time high, General Yakubu Gowon and other key members of the government agreed to meet with Colonel Ojuku at a neutral location so that both sides could try to de-escalate the situation. This two-day meeting will take place in the Ghanaian town of Aburi from the 4th to the 5th of January 1967. To Gowon's great surprise, Colonel Ojuku took the meeting very seriously and was very well prepared. He set out very clearly all of the eastern region's demands, which included greater political autonomy, greater control over the revenue from the southeast oil deposits, and also a restructuring of the Nigerian army in a way that devolved powers to the regions and got rid of the unfair recruitment quota system which had allowed for a disproportionately large number of northerners to join the Nigerian army. Although many still debate what exactly was agreed at this meeting, General Ojuku left Aburi fully convinced that Gowon had accepted all of the eastern region's demands. This controversial agreement, known today as the Aburi Accord, was not honored by the Gowan administration. Upon returning to Nigeria, General Yakubu Gowan decided instead to break Nigeria's regions into smaller states and turn Nigeria into an American-style federation composed of 12 states. Except unlike in the American system, each state had very little autonomy and very little control over its own resources. For many in the southeast, this was the last straw. With the Gowon administration having put its cards on the table, Colonel Ojuku's mind was made up. He proceeded to consult with the various chiefs and traditional rulers of the eastern region and on the 30th of May 1967, Ojuku officially announced the secession of the eastern region and the establishment of the state of Biafra. And with the support of many key members of the southeastern leadership, Colonel Ojuku cut all ties with the Nigerian army and was proclaimed General Ojuku, Biafran President and Commander-in-Chief of the Biafran Army. The declaration of Biafra's secession was celebrated in the streets. For many, the establishment of Biafra was a long-awaited restoration of the pre-colonial sovereignty of the region and the beginning of a bright new dawn for its people. But unfortunately, the celebrations would be short-lived, as the Nigerian government's response was to declare war on Biafra. And although the Biafran army had no air force, no navy, and a chronic shortage of weapons and manpower, General Ojuku was surprisingly optimistic about his new nation's ability to withstand the Nigerian army.
if civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent, you're quite right, it will for us be the price of freedom. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. And I'm confident that it will not last long. I can't say for certain what Lagos has got. Um, when we lost direct contact with Lagos, they had some four battalions ill-equipped and um, I know that they have been purchasing a lot of arms since and I know that they have negotiated and received a few armored vehicles. Prior to that they had some scout cars. I know they have tried to get planes I am not sure they have got them there. But on our side, we too have not been sitting quietly. There has been quite a lot of build-up. And I think what I have here is sufficient to maintain the integrity of Biafra and more. Putting aside General Ojuku's confident fighting talk, the reality of the matter was that Biafra was by far the underdog in this fight. The Nigerian military was larger, better funded, better trained, and had secured the support of Britain and other world powers. The expectation in Lagos was for the war to be over within a matter of weeks, or in the very worst case scenario, six months. But much to the surprise of the Nigerians, the Biafran army would prove a lot more resilient than they could have ever imagined. Despite being composed of a largely untrained and unskilled group of young men and teenage boys, the Biafrans would manage to withstand the Nigerian onslaught for three brutal years. The early campaigns of the Nigerian forces were quite successful, as they quickly managed to reclaim significant Biafran cities and monuments. But after nearly a year of fighting, the war reached a stalemate as the Biafran army began to stand its ground and maintain control of key cities and towns. Within the nation itself, the civilian population tried to carry on living life as normally as they could. With most of the men and boys on the battlefront, it was up to the women to manage the day-to-day -day running of the country. But as the war raged on, any hopes that the civilian population had of continuing to live their normal lives began to fade away. With both sides unable to reach an agreement, despite several attempts at peace talks, including one in Ethiopia presided over by Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie, the Gowon administration came to the very reckless conclusion that the only way to break the deadlock would be to trigger its nuclear option. the Gowan-led forces mobilized to impose an economic blockade on Biafra, which blocked the flow of all food and ammunition supplies by land, air and sea. This move would turn out to be perhaps the single most destructive political decision in West African history, as it would ultimately lead to the death by malnourishment of an estimated 2 million civilians 
most of whom were children suffering from the protein deficiency disease known as kwashoko. You see, prior to the war, dietary protein in the Biafran diet primarily consisted of locally sourced seafood as well as dried stockfish, which was imported from Norway. Other sources of protein such as chicken, pork and beef were generally only enjoyed on special occasions as they were often too expensive for the wider population. But as the blockade prevented the importation of Norwegian stockfish and also restricted local fishermen's access to the seas, the region's protein supplies were quickly depleted and the national diet was reduced to almost 100% starch. As the war took place around the golden era of TV media, the images of millions of minority Biafran children projected on TV sets worldwide would be one of the global community's earliest introductions to the now infamous trope of the starving African child. Although the Nigerian government's strategy was indefensible, it is important to point out that the government's supposed reasoning at the time was that the blockade would be nothing more than a short sharp shock and that General Ojuku, seeing the immense suffering of his people and the dwindling ammunition of his frontline soldiers, would have no other choice but to surrender. However, what the Nigerians had failed to realize was that the Biafran state had secured the support of a foreign benefactor of its own. Although the only countries to publicly recognize the state of Biafra were Tanzania, Gabon, the Ivory Coast, Zambia and Haiti, Charles de Gaulle's France had taken a secret interest in Biafra as it saw it as the perfect addition to its sphere of influence in West Africa. According to French President Charles de Gaulle, Biafra was a just and noble cause, and so working closely with the French aligned governments of the Ivory Coast under President Félix Oufred Boigny and the Gabonese Republic, led by President Omar Bongo, the French government helped to prolong the war by providing Biafra with weapons, mercenary fighters and as much food as could be smuggled past the Nigerian blockade. France also publicized Biafra's cause on the international stage, describing the situation as nothing short of a genocide. The eventual discovery of France's involvement in the war would lead to protests on the streets of Lagos, with many accusing the French government of being the real reason why the war had continued, despite the fact that the Biafran forces had very little chance of overcoming the Nigerian military. But did France really get involved in the war simply because Charles de Gaulle considered Biafra to be a just and noble cause? Well, not exactly. France's involvement was all about economics and had very little to do with some romantic desire for the Biafran people to share in the French ideals of liberté, égalité and fraternité. Later investigations will show how the French state-owned oil company ELF had secured lucrative drilling agreements with the Biafran state. Had Biafra successfully seceded from Nigeria, these agreements would have guaranteed ELF access to the equivalent of 7% of Nigeria's oil supply and given the French government a nice slice of the Nigerian pie, which since the discovery of oil back in 1956, had been enjoyed solely by the Shell BP oil company. Although the French government tried to keep his ties to Biafra secret, General Ujuku did very little to hide his country's French connection. From as early as the first year of the war, General Ujuku had already begun to suggest that French would be made compulsory in Biafran secondary, technical and teacher training schools. In his own words, he was very keen for his people to benefit from the rich culture of the French-speaking world. As the death toll began to rise exponentially, the whole world was becoming more aware of the level of carnage and immense suffering of the Biafran people. The Nigerian diaspora was galvanized and protests and counter-protests began to take place on the streets of London and New York. Some Nigerians blamed General Ojuku for the deaths of his own people, 
arguing that by continuing in a war that he knew fully well he could not win, he was putting his personal ambition ahead of the lives of millions of people. But for many in the Biafran diaspora, the economic blockade was nothing short of a vicious genocide aimed at exterminating the evil people once and for all. Another accusation that was thrown at General Ojuku was that the only way he managed to cajole his army and his people to continue in the fight for Biafra was by reporting stories of false victories and by giving false guarantees about the imminent end of the war. On the Nigerian side, the government continued to double down on its position. Despite reports of horrific levels of death and suffering, the Gowan-led government refused to blink first and continued to accuse General Lojuku of killing his own people by lying to them about their chances of winning the war. I do not wish to say anything on this occasion that might be regarded as prejudicial to the peace talks now going on in Kampala, Uganda. But in the words of Mr. Asika, the rebel leaders ought to know when enough is enough. They should call a halt to the shameless deception of innocent Igbos with reports of fictitious victories on the battlefronts. They should appreciate that the so-called diplomatic recognition by dubious characters cannot, in the least, alter the course of Nigerian history. It is sheer wickedness for Ojuku and his clique to continue to guard innocent citizens to support rebellion and lay down their lives for a cause that is not just. The rebel leaders know in their hearts of hearts that all their false propaganda about genocide and massacre derives from personal ambition and the haunting fear of their own future and safety. Consequently, they do not know when to stop. I call on those who claim to love Nigeria and the Igbos to face realities and advise the people of the East Central State to lay down their arms and return to the fold. It is not enough for organizations and individuals to ask the federal government to cease hostilities while ignoring the evil intentions of the rebels. I honestly believe it is in the true interest of the Igbos that they return to the fatherland. I am satisfied that all other Nigerians have learned the lesson of our most recent history and the current civil war. And I pray to God that there will never be a repetition. You see, contrary to popular belief, the Biafran government was much more than just a rebel military force. General Ojuku also assembled a group of elite writers and artists who were tasked with cultivating nationalist spirit at home and also spreading Biafra's message on the world stage. Political cartoons were put up all around the country, pushing simplistic interpretations of the causes of the war and demonizing not just the Nigerian military but the Nigerian populace at large. On the international stage, Notable members of the Biafran apparatus, such as Chinua Achebe and Gabriel Okara, publicized the plight of the Biafran people. They regularly denounced the actions of the Nigerian government and spoke about the atrocities they had witnessed in the country. The Biafran story became front page news, and more and more members of the international community began to call on their own governments to take action. On the 29th of May 1969, Bruce Mayrock, an American student at Columbia University, set himself on fire at the United Nations headquarters in New York in protest of what he believed was a genocide against the nation and people of Biafra. He was pronounced dead the very next day. With more and more of their own citizens calling for political intervention, the response from Nigeria's international backers was to ramp up their military support for the Nigerian forces to help them break the Biafran resistance once and for all. With their increased firepower, the Nigerian Federal Forces launched another major attack on the Biafran defense in the last week of December 1969. This final offensive, known as Operation Tailwind, 
was executed by a battalion led by Colonel Olushegun Obasanjo, a man who would later go on to be a two-time president of Nigeria. Operation Tailwind would ultimately break the deadlock. After over three weeks of heavy fighting, the last two major strongholds of Oweri and Uli fell to the Nigerian forces. Unwilling to go down with the Biafran ship, General Ojuku fled by plane to the Ivory Coast, leaving behind his deputy Philip F. Young to negotiate the terms of Biafra's surrender to General Yakubu Gowon on the 14th of January 1970. The so-called rising sun of Biafra is set forever. It will be a great disservice for anyone to continue to use the word Biafra to refer to any part of the east central state of Nigeria. The tragic chapter of violence is just ended. We are at the dawn of national reconciliation. Once again, we have an opportunity to build a new nation. You will have heard that my government may seek the assistance of friendly foreign governments and bodies, especially in the provision of equipment to supplement our national effort. There are, however, a number of foreign governments and organizations whose so-called assistance will not be welcome. These are the governments and organizations which sustained the rebellion. They are thus guilty of the blood of thousands who perished because of the prolongation of the futile rebel, rebel uh, resistance. They did not act out of love for humanity. Their purpose was to disintegrate Nigeria and Africa and impose their will on us. To say that the Nigerian government did not do enough to bring healing and reconciliation in the years following the war would be a gross understatement. Even the federal troops that were deployed to assist in the resettlement of the survivors of the war would be accused of taking advantage of the people that were there to help. There are complaints about the behaviour of your troops. Many women say they've been molested and raped. Men say their property has been taken away from them, looted. Do you know anything about that? I don't think that is true to say um, general uh, looting and uh, raping and rest of it. That couldn't be true. Uh, you know in every war there's always um, one or two odd soldiers who will behave in the uh, out of the general pattern and uh, well we, i won't deny that there will be cases of this and you do realize that it's not very easy for um officers to be there all the time to check this type of thing but everything has been done to keep the soldiers out of the villages out of the roads out of the town um, but here in the center of this town Colonel, i've personally seen soldiers taking household gear away from people's homes loading it onto trucks and driving away a sergeant major stopped one truck and made them take some stuff off that um, sometimes we carry refugees with their belongings mm. from the towns to the villages. Yeah. Uh, this could be. So but, this, um, this, was just, this was just property being taken out of a house, furniture, a bedstead, among other things. Well, that might be one of the, uh, uh, the cases, uh, the few odd cases I've talked about. Mm. But uh, there are always people around who will check this type of thing, you know. <laughs> Have the federal troops behaved badly since they came here? Have they beaten people? Yeah, well, that's seizing of their things. And I beg seizing of their properties. They seize property. Properties and they're putting some girls and ladies. They are forcing them. Forcing themselves on girls yes, and ladies. Forcing them. Taking some wives from people who try to do something they like. Have they killed have they been killing people? No. no. They don't kill civilians. Do they bring food in with them to feed the population? In fact, they, they don't. They don't. We are still no food. Since three days now, we haven't taken anything. Are you, you are hungry? We are hungry. Very, very. Even my children, you can see them in the house now, lying down. Even nothing to take. The Biafra money, when we give them, they say no. The Biafra money is of it's, no it's use. It's news. Do 
you know anything about raping or looting? No, I know nothing about that. What about food supply? Is it true that the relief supplies are not coming in? All right, we have to make a distinction between the rural areas and the towns. It, 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 they are, it is coming into the towns because it's easier to arrange for transport. But obviously, it's more difficult to get the to penetrate into the rural area. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any relief supplies here? Where is the feeding station? Oh, no, this is my first visit to Oweri. I'm living about eight or nine miles away. Yeah. I mean, people really say that there isn't such a centre. Well, we I've seen just come from the police barracks, and they are distributing food every day down in the police barracks for their people. Well, the police, not the Nigerian Red Cross. The war had left millions of Igbos homeless, bereaved, and unemployed. To make matters worse, Nigeria had changed its currency during the war, and so the many Easterners who still held the old Nigerian currency were left in a very precarious position. The man who was tasked by the Gowon administration to rectify the problem was the former opposition leader, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, who at the time was Nigeria's Commissioner of Finance. His solution was to simply award every Easterner a grand total of 20 Nigerian pounds, regardless of how much money he or she had in their bank accounts prior to the war. For obvious reasons, this policy was seen as a deliberate attempt to cripple the economic recovery of the Igbo middle and upper classes. It was also at this time that the Gowon administration passed the controversial indigenization decree, which basically forced all foreign-owned companies operating in Nigeria to sell a proportion of their shares to Nigerian citizens. With many Igbos left with just 20 Nigerian pounds to their name, the main beneficiaries of the indigenization policy were the wealthy Yoruba and Hausa Fulani elites. Even till today, the wealth of a few of Nigeria's most prominent Hausa Fulani and Yoruba families can be traced all the way back to shares that were acquired under Gowon's indigenization policy. A whole 50 years have now passed since the end of the civil war, but the ghost of Biafra continues to haunt the Nigerian state. Just one year after the death of General Ojuku in 2011, a group known as the Indigenous People of Biafra, or IPOB for short, became the latest among several post-war Biafran secessionist movements that have tried to lead a second Biafran breakaway. The response from the Nigerian government has again been very heavy-handed, showing how little has been learned from the mistakes of the war. The IPOB leader, Inamdi Kanu, has been arrested and harassed numerous times by the Nigerian state, which has only helped to energize his base and build his cult-like following. The Biafran question now occupies a menacing position in Nigeria's political terrain, and with each passing day, it is becoming very clear that the Nigerian government can no longer continue to sweep the matter under the carpet. The IPOB are not the only independence movement threatening to break the Nigerian Union. The oil-rich Niger Delta region, which despite being the source of Nigeria's wealth, remains one of the most underdeveloped regions in the country, has for many years been riddled with militant separatist groups such as the Niger Delta Avengers and the Niger Delta Greenland Justice Mandate. Similarly, for many years, a number of groups in the Yoruba heartlands have been calling for the creation of a separate Yoruba state that would be known as the Odudua Republic. The one thing that unites all of these groups is the strong belief that nothing has really changed since colonial times. In other words, the only group that still has a vested interest in the continuity of the Nigerian Union are the Northern elites. And in all honesty, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand why this view is so prevalent. There is no doubt that a breakup of Nigeria would most likely lead to economic ruin for a lot of rich and powerful northerners who could potentially find themselves left behind in a landlocked country with no access to the sea, no oil revenue, and a large undereducated population of which an estimated 50% of women have no formal education. When Frederick Lugard created Nigeria back in 1914, it was arguable that he had no idea how badly the Nigerian project would turn out. But what has become very clear over a century later is that Nigeria in its current state just does not work. For a country as large and as diverse as Nigeria, the concentration of power in the Nigerian federal government is a recipe for disaster. With large sections of its population continuing to express feelings of marginalization and disconnection from the federal government, many have been putting forward the very sensible case for a restructuring of the country in a way that devolves power from the federal government to the various regions. This would mean giving each region power over their own resources and a greater ability to decide their own destinies. But while the idea of devolving powers from the federal government may be good for Nigeria as a whole, 
it would obviously mean a loss of power for those who benefit under the current system. For obvious reasons, these vested interests are the biggest stumbling blocks preventing any sensible conversation about the state of the nation. For the sake of the many innocent and peace-loving Nigerians, one can only hope and pray that the Nigerian establishment chooses to loosen its tight grip on power before it's too late.